Over the past year, there have been numerous heartbreaking headlines about the inability of authorities to cope with the massive death toll brought about by COVID-19. These stories are, sadly, nothing new in history, even if the average person now knows of them thanks to the invention of social media. In the 19th century, city leaders had similar difficulties and concerns about the dangers posed by a large number of decomposing corpses. If anything, prior to refrigeration, they had more reason to be concerned, though they also had less scientific knowledge about the extent of the danger. My topic today is one such instance, which comes from the New Year's Day issue of the Irish Builder in 1884, and I'm putting a link to a digital handout I created in the chat box for you. In it, an anonymous writer, or writers, made a plea for cremation. The crux of their argument is that public health and sanitation considerations make cremation the smartest way to dispose of a corpse, especially in urban areas like Dublin that had a concentrated population. The 19th century saw a multitude of what I decided to call calamities, the Napoleonic and Crimean Wars, epidemics, mass starvation, and these all had extremely high death tolls. With each event, there were debates in government and the press about what to do with the bodies, for even if they did not die of disease, science was advanced enough to know that a corpse could become a source of illness if not handled properly. In the latter half of the century, much pressure was put on officials to cremate corpses, especially from mass casualty events. As we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, there will always be people who have their reasons for refusing to follow public health advice. In Ireland, in the 1880s, the two most prevalent arguments against cremation were religion, not surprisingly, and, unexpectedly, a fear that murderers might use cremation as a way to hide their crimes. This last topic is actually how I came across the Irish Builder article while doing my ongoing research on the history of crime, so I will dive a bit deeper on that aspect when we get to it. Eventually, these debates made their way to the UK Parliament and culminated in the passage of the Cremation Act of 1902, which did not apply to Ireland and would not apply to Northern Ireland until 1948. Therefore, the reason Ireland's path on this issue deviated from Great Britain and sentiment in the rest of Europe and the United States will also be considered. The anonymous author in The Irish Builder provides eminently practical suggestions about the disposal of corpses. They explain issues of decomposition, legislation, and the water supply as matters of fact, not opinion. Religious considerations are observed kindly, with a tone of hope that those who hold unwise ones will soon modernize their thinking enough to do the right thing by society with respect to cremation. Quote, Despite religious convictions and conscientious scruples now existing on the part of many, we think the time is not far distant when cremation will be universally adopted. End quote. They challenge religious convictions by reminding readers that cremation used to be common in Ireland. This was a standard approach taken up by other advocates of cremation in other locations. In a paper presented to the American Philosophical Society in Washington, D.C. the preceding year, James Mooney detailed the funeral customs of Ireland, with a focus on cremation at New Grange, among other examples. Having a long history of cremation on the island was not sufficient to displace the Christian values that were so solidly established, however. This tension between ancient customs and centrally, centuries of funerals with coffins was not easy to overcome, much as the advocates for sanitary practices wish it could be. As noted in the Irish Builder, quote, cremation may be said to be a pagan custom, but that does not constitute it immoral, unquote. Yet, many people in 19th century Ireland did feel it was immoral. The recalcitrance on the question of morality caused a good deal of frustration amongst those who had more modern sensibilities. Quote, For charity's sake, we will respect their feelings, but we are utterly unable to understand their arguments against such a method of disposing of our dead. From a sanitary point of view, their objections are absurd and must be relegated to an age of darkness, which we have happily passed. Unquote. The frequency of such comments was the result of Pope Leo XIII's ratification of a document in 1886 that condemned anyone who requested cremation for themselves or someone else. As a result, Catholics who chose cremation were deprived of a proper Christian burial. This stance was further reinforced in 1892 when it was decreed that priests could not give such persons the last rites, nor could a public funeral mass be said for them. 
A 21st century explanation of this policy notes that exceptions could be made, particularly in cases where public health safety was in question, i.e. in an epidemic or pandemic. But the mindset of parishioners quickly became opposed to cremation. It simply was not to be done. What good Catholic wanted to risk excommunication for the sake of public health concerns they did not understand? The policy issued in Rome was put to the test the very next year during a cholera outbreak. A report about it focused on ways to prevent the diffusion of the disease that included such sound advice as isolating the sick and destruction of contaminated bedding, clothing, etc. The final point stated that the, quote, cremation of remains of cholera patients shall be under the usual precautions pertaining to other infectious diseases and expressly argued against burial in the so-called common pits, unquote. So cremation was not forbidden, nor was it encouraged, despite sufficient knowledge that burning bedding and the like was what was needed to rid the environment of the disease. What the civil authorities knew they should do was being curbed by the religious authorities located in the center of their capital. Italy was one of several countries during the 1880s that began taking more steps to ensure the health of their citizens by way of sanitation practices, including cremation. In Spain, a law was passed granting permission to cremate human bodies, and the practice was becoming common in France and Germany as well. The greatest location of concern was within a city where space for cemeteries was limited. The Paris catacombs had been used for centuries as a way to dispose of remains, yet a modern city needed a more modern solution. During 1884, six societies for the advancement of cremation were established in the United States, joining several others already in existence. The arguments put forward in all these countries align perfectly with the sentiments in the Irish Builder, when the author noted that they, quote, look upon a gigantic cemetery in the immediate vicinity of any city or town as a gigantic evil that should not be allowed to be perpetuated by the state, unquote. Politically, in the United Kingdom, cremation was one of many hot topics advocates were trying to make time for on Westminster's agenda. While well, arguments about home rule or the extension of the franchise received the majority of attention from historians, these were often of less interest to actual MPs at the time. A handbook to political questions of the day, published in 1885, written by Sidney Buxton, MP for Peterborough at the time, has an entire chapter on cremation that comes before his chapter on Irish home rule. I'm not arguing that his prioritization was standard by any means, but it does show how cremation was heating up as a subject of discussion within government. The focus in Buxton's text is about the regulation of cremation, now that it was legal to cremate human bodies. MPs were considering placing cremation under the auspices of the Home Office, and they wanted to establish specific steps to be taken before a cremation could happen. For example, a death certificate should be drawn up only after an independent inspection of the body to be made by an official. As the subtitle of Buxton's book promises, he presents arguments both for and against this proposal. All of the public health considerations top the list of pros, while several items on his cons list focus on the practical difficulties of such a system. He notes that the steps required would be expensive and difficult to accomplish in rural areas. Additionally, he argues, quote, it is useless to legislate for a reform which no one would avail themselves. The existing crematoriums have practically not been used at all, thus proving that public opinion is decidedly against cremation." Unquote. Finally, he raises questions about the health dangers, saying that they are much exaggerated. As with all political debates, this back and forth would continue for the remainder of the decade as each side tried to garner enough support to either introduce and pass legislation or get it blocked entirely. In 1889, a book entitled Cremation and Urn Burial, or The Cemeteries of the Future, laid out numerous suggestions in support of the practice. With specific respect to Ireland, the author, William Robinson, pointed out the, quote, incalculable advantages cremation would give over the present system of encasing the dead body in lead and oak and leaving it beneath the floor where priests and people daily attend public worship, unquote. Not stopping with that mental image, he added that people would be, quote, exposed to more or less great danger for months and years from the poisonous emanations which must escape so long as more than dry bones remain, unquote. 
these comets were not made with respect to those who died of disease, merely to the standard decomposition of a human body. The solution he described was that a crematory chamber be put under the church and the deceased be lowered into it during the service. Then, as the funeral oration and musical accompaniment keeps a vast congregation spellbound for an hour, the body could be incinerated and placed in an exquisite urn complete with inscriptions honoring the dead person. If it was not possible to add a crematorium beneath an existing church, one could be built behind it instead. Such arrangements would deal with the question of disease, even if Robinson did not specify that in his description. The foremost cremation advocate of the day, Sir Henry Thompson, summed up the debates of the 1880s in his book, Modern Cremation, Its History and Practice, published in 1889. Thompson was president of the Cremation Society of England and, as such, was aware of what approaches had been more or less successful in convincing people of the benefits of cremation. A review of the book in The Lancet praises Thompson's objectivity, stating he discusses the topic with candor and moderation. The bulk of the review, and indeed the most important aspect of Thompson's book, focuses on the medical-legal questions about cremation. Essentially, that murderers might use cremation as a way to hide their crimes, poison in particular. It was a topic that popped up at various points earlier in the decade. The article in the Irish Builder called for an organized system of post-mortem examination in every case. Sidney Buxton commented on it the following year, claiming, quote, in India and elsewhere where cremation takes place, poisoning is known to be a very frequent occurrence, unquote. Aspersions against India notwithstanding, the idea that criminal activity might be hidden by cremating a body soon became the dominant argument against cremation. By the end of the 1880s, Thompson knew this and was trying to push for increased regulations. Postmortems and death certificates, certainly, but also strict enforcement of cremation when it was clear that a person had died from infectious disease. So rather than having one set of procedures for cremation, there should be at least two tracks. One for those with doubtful cases that might require criminal investigation, and another for those where the cause of death was unmistakable. An article in The Chemist and Druggist in September 1889 about vermin killers containing strychnine offers ample scientific and medical legal detail about the ability to detect the chemical in a human body after death. It cites the leading medical jurisprudence textbook of the day, written by Woodman and Tidy, and concludes that despite efforts to add colorants to chemicals like arsenic or strychnine, scientists are still not able to detect strychnine after cremation. With respect to arsenic, known colloquially as inheritance powder, the introduction of substances that color chemicals is ineffectual because it, quote, does not prevent a would-be murderer from obtaining a large quantity of the poison, provided he can give some plausible excuse for acquiring it, unquote. Worrying about detecting crime after the fact did nothing to prevent the crime itself. Similarly, in discussing cremation in poison cases, the real consideration was not how many corpses are ever exhumed for forensic analysis, but that many murders might be prevented by the fear that the body may bear for months the evidence of guilt. There was then a need to balance real dangers with potential ones, all the while trying to guess at and steer public perceptions of both. Sir Henry Thompson's arguments were countered vehemently in the early 1890s when Francis Seymour Hayden read a paper at the Society of the Arts in November 1892. In it, he notes several famous or infamous cases when an exhumed body or bodies did indeed provide proof of murder. One of these examples, that of Irish sisters Catherine Flanagan and Margaret Higgins, known as the Black Widows of Liverpool, involved a post-mortem examination that found traces of arsenic. Hayden points out that this one crime led to the disinterment of 10 additional bodies as corroborating evidence, and the inability to do so would have stood in the way of a fair trial. Such thoroughness is admirable, yet even in the 21st century it is unlikely to happen in most murder cases due to the expenditure of resources needed. Hayden reached the same conclusion in his analysis too. Furthermore, he adds a new argument against cremation, that the ash and smoke created by the process is its own threat to public health. Hayden's ultimate conclusion was not that cremation be regulated along the lines suggested by Thompson, but that it be, quote, at once declared a misdemeanor and burial be established as the only legal mode of disposing a dead body, unquote. 
He also argued that there should be limits on the amount of time a body could be left unburied, so no wakes. And no coffins or vaults should be used that retard the decomposition of the corpse by the earth. After the steady modernizing progress of arguments during the 1880s, Hayden's approach would throw everything back hundreds of years. When the Cremation Act of 1902 finally passed, it called for the establishment of burial authorities on the local level that were to maintain burial grounds, inspect crematoria, and oversee the regulation of death records. Penalties for people who made false declarations in order to cremate a body, especially those, quote, with intent to conceal the commission or impede the prosecution of any offense, unquote, included up to two years imprisonment with or without hard labor. Like much legislation in Westminster, this act was written to apply to England and Wales initially, with the House of Lords debating the merits of amending it to include Ireland and Scotland. Several members spoke up to add Scotland to the legislation, insisting that the northern nation was not behind in matters associated with cremation and already had an excellent crematorium in Glasgow. The existence of facilities, or lack thereof, took up a fair bit of their discussion, as did the terminology used for the local governments that would be responsible for enforcement. Aside from a lot of speculation about what the Irish might think of the act, for it had not been investigated in committee, the most definite statement was made that, quote, there was no pressing case for applying it to that country, unquote. In more cynical terms, they decided not to extend it to Ireland because they were worried it would not pass if they did. There was no mention of fears about criminals getting away with murder when it came to the actual debate in the House of Lords. Religious considerations were dealt with swiftly by Lord Hugh Cecil, first Baron Quickswood, who acknowledged Roman Catholic opposition to cremation while pointing out that just because the act would establish policies and procedures for cremation, no one would be forced to be cremated. With that in mind, he thought there should be no objection to the act being applied to all constituent nations of the UK. What's more, he argued, quote, the proper course was to treat the whole of the United Kingdom as one in this matter. It was too much the custom to make bills easy to pass through Parliament by adopting illogical distinctions, unquote. The account of his comments in Hansard mentioned that he, quote, had no desire to wreck the bill, unquote, despite wanting his objection noted for the record. Ultimately, the issue of cremation lacks sufficient urgency within the Irish context for it to be resolved legislatively. Elsewhere in Europe and in the United States, centers of population were significant enough in size that establishing procedures for cremation became necessary. In Ireland, the pressure was nowhere near as acute, therefore the danger posed by epidemic disease was not as severe as it was in more densely populated areas. Ironically, past calamities and emig emigration lessened the need to modernize burial practices in the way other countries in Europe were doing. As a result, the arguments about criminal deviance did not resonate in Ireland as they did elsewhere, even if Irish people living in England were wrapped up in the debates on account of their notorious actions. Religious considerations were certainly important within the Irish context, but they did not prevent the debates from occurring. The slower pace, then, was due as much to a lack of need as it was to a simple prioritizing of other issues ahead of the cremation question. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions and comments.